Hello and welcome to this introduction to spinning disk microscopy. I'm Louis Keel, a field application specialist with Photometrics. So to begin with, we'll start by looking at the problem with conventional wide field fluorescence microscopy. Here we have a schematic of a wide field system, and here we have a sample. We can choose to focus on a certain focal plane within the sample for the features that we want to observe. But what we can't do with a wide field microscope is choose to only receive light from this focal plane. Fluorophores from above and below our chosen focal plane will also be illuminated and also give off light, which will reach our detector. Most biological samples are three-dimensional structures, with fluorescence throughout. Finer details, especially those inside cells, become impossible to observe over the background, and often a microscopist will want to observe inside cells. The solution to this problem is to only allow light from our chosen focal plane to reach the detector. This is achieved through blocking light from other focal planes by placing a pinhole in the optical path. This is a so-called optical sectioning technique, meaning we were able to choose which vertical section of the sample we wanted to look at. The way this works is fairly simple. Light from our chosen focal plane will pass through the optical system and come to a tight focus within the aperture of the pinhole. This light will pass through to the detector. Light from other focal planes, here such as light from below our chosen plane, will also pass through the system but won't come to a tight focus and the majority of this light will be blocked. The same is true for light from above our focal plane. Additionally, for light coming from to the side, only light from the exact point that we want to image will reach the detector. The result of this improvement is that we can make three-dimensional cross-sections, such as this video here of HeLa cell nuclei. On the left we have the confocal image and on the right we have the epifluorescence. You can see that the image contrast and clarity is much better for the confocal image. And then it's much easier to localize exactly where the red sparks, which indicate sites of DNA replication, are to be found. The first microscope using this principle was a laser scanning confocal microscope. This was invented in 1969 by David Egger and Paul Davidovitz at Yale University. As you recall from our pinhole schematic earlier, only light from a single point of focus within the sample can pass through any given pinhole. We therefore need to scan this point across our sample to generate an entire 2D image. This is achieved through X and Y Galvo scanning mirrors. The excitation laser beam is raster scanned across the image by these mirrors. The returning light passes through the optical system before being focused through a pinhole and reaching some photomultiplier tubes. The images resulting from this microscopy technique can be truly beautiful, very good contrast, very good optical sectioning in multicolors. But this comes at a cost. Each and every part of our sample must have a laser beam tightly focused onto it. This can be very damaging for live cells, leading to much problems with photobleaching and phototoxicity. Also, as we have to scan the entire image, this technique is very slow with acquisition times of anything from half a second to two seconds per Z slice. Both the high illumination strength and this slow scanning make this technique quite unsuitable for studying live cells. It's also expensive to put together, requiring many precise moving parts and expensive high-powered lasers. In order to overcome these issues, we need to scan multiple parts of the image in parallel. We can achieve this by scanning the image with multiple pinholes and using a detector such as a camera that's capable of parallel acquisition. Then multiple points from our sample will reach independent pinholes. So in order to observe an entire image, we now need to scan multiple pinholes across the image. This is achieved based on a principle invented by Paul Nipkoff in 1884 on his work in the early television. Here pinholes are arranged on a disc in an Archimedean spiral. As the disc rotates, pinholes scan across lines of the image, and the two-dimensional image was turned into a one-dimensional sequence of information. David Egger and Moimir Petran later adapted the Nipkov disk into the first spinning disk confocal microscope in 1967. The spinning disk confocal microscope is based around the so-called Petran disk, where many Archimedean spirals are arranged on a single disk, 
and thousands of pinholes illuminate the sample simultaneously. These pinholes are typically scanned across the image multiple times per exposure, and every part of the image is scanned by a pinhole each 30 degree rotation of the disk. Another key advantage of scanning in parallel is that we no longer have to use very inefficient photomultiplier tubes. We can instead use really high quantum efficiency cameras. The quantum efficiency of a photomultiplier tube, the number of incident photons that are converted into electrons, can be low as 10 or 15 percent. For modern camera technology that's in excess of 90 percent. The result of this parallelization is a technique that's much more gentle. Much less excitation light is needed than laser scanning can focal microscopy, and that light itself is much less concentrated, meaning that photo bleaching is slightly mitigated. It's much faster, capturing large fields of view in as little as 5 milliseconds as opposed to the seconds or so that it would take for a laser scanning confocal. And at the piezo stage, sub 1 second Z stacks are possible, depending on how many steps you take. This means the imaging of live cells in three dimensions over long time periods is now possible. This means that studying dynamic processes becomes possible. Here we have a movie of platelet behaviour in the live mouse brain, in three channels, imaged in vivo. However, with this technique there are some trade-offs. We need to balance how good quality our optical section is with how much light we want to block from our sample. Since the pinholes are small, they in fact block most of the light passing through the optical system. The proportion that they block is called the transmittance ratio, and that depends upon the size, diameter d, and the separation s of the pinholes, where the transmittance ratio scales with d divided by s squared. For typical values for a typical spinning disk system, d is 50 micrometers and s would be 250 micrometers. This would mean that transmittance ratio is only 4%, so the vast majority of the light incident upon the disk is blocked by it. We therefore need strong illumination, so typically a laser is used. One means of significantly improving the transmission of excitation light through the pinhole disk is to use a second disk. This disk contains a microlens array corresponding to the pinhole array on the first disk. These microlenses focus the excitation beam through the pinholes of the pinhole disk. Transmission for excitation light is therefore increased up to tenfold. However, this has no influence on the amount of emission light detected. It's obvious from the transmission equation that using a larger pinhole results in more light reaching the sample and more light coming back from the sample. However, this also worsens our optical section. Choosing the optimal pinhole size is therefore a trade-off determined by the optical system itself. The optimal diameter of a pinhole is given by the size of the first airy disk minimum, which is 1.2 times the magnification of the objective, times the emission wavelength of your sample, divided by the numerical aperture of the objective. A typical spinning disk system will have pinholes of around 25 or 50 micrometers. This roughly corresponds for, for example, GFP, to the optimal size for 100 times 1.4 NA objective, and in the case of 25 micrometers, to a 60 times objective. However, what happens if we use a pinhole that's not quite the right size? In the case of a pinhole that's too small, as in A and C of this diagram, for the illumination path, a too small pinhole will diffract light too much. This light won't be able to be focused to a tight point in our focal plane by the objective, and will therefore waste light. Further, in the emission path, a pinhole smaller than one airy disk will unnecessarily block light from our chosen focal plane as well, reducing transmission for no real gain in resolution or contrast. For a pinhole that's too large, you can sometimes have a problem where the beam isn't diffracted enough, however this is unlikely to be an issue for laser sources. What will always be a concern, however, is that if your pinhole is too big, the resulting optical section is much thicker. The area from which light can be in focus and can reach through the pinhole is much larger. This reduces the quality of optical sectioning. 60 times and 100 times are the most commonly used objectives for spinning disk microscopy, but sometimes 40 times and lower are used. Unless you're using a system with correspondingly smaller pinholes for your smaller magnification objectives, you're therefore typically using pinholes that are too large, and your optical sectioning quality will significantly decrease. 
Another means of improving the transmission of light through the disc would be to reduce the distance between pinholes. However, decreasing the distance between pinholes leads to a problem called pinhole crosstalk. If we were to imagine for a moment that the pinhole disc is within the same plane as fluorophores, for a slightly out of focus fluorophore, this will be blocked by the pinhole disc as we expect. However, for a fluorophore that's sufficiently far from our chosen focal plane, there's a chance that the light emerging from it will enter neighbouring pinholes. This problem obviously worsens the closer pinholes are to each other. For thick samples, this can lead to a background haze that means our contrast is reduced. To quantify this, here we have a plot of the relative intensity of light given off by a fluorophore versus the distance vertically from that fluorophore. For a wide field image where we have no optical sectioning ability whatsoever, there's no difference in the relative intensity as we get further vertically from the fluorophore. However, for a confocal laser scanning microscope, the optical sectioning is really quite good, and 4 micrometers from the sample we'd expect no light whatsoever. For spinning disc confocal, here we have two different separation distances, two different values of s. For pinholes spaced far apart, we still have fairly good optical sectioning and fairly good blocking of out-of-focus light. However, as we decrease the distance between pinholes, for any separation greater than that, our relative intensity is fairly high, meaning that we have strong background haze. The consequence of this is that if you expect to be examining fairly thick samples, you need to use a spinning disc with a large separation between pinholes. Spinning disc confocal microscopy is capable of capturing very high speed dynamic events with very good time resolution. However, care must be taken when the time taken to acquire one image starts to approach the time taken for the pinholes to scan across the disc. This is illustrated in this series of images of HeLa cells at increasing disc speed and increasing exposure time. For most spinning discs, 12 complete scans of the image are taken by the pinholes per full disc rotation. At short exposure times, the exposure must be matched to a whole number of scans of the pinholes to prevent streaking artifacts, as in this image. These dark lines show where no pinhole has passed over the image during the exposure of the image. As the exposure time is increased, a small difference in the whole number of scans across different parts of the image has less of an effect, and at high disk rotation speeds, the effect is averaged out completely. So at long exposure times, multiple scans average out across the image. However, for the fastest acquisition, precisely timed triggering can be used to synchronize the exposure of the camera to a single or a whole number of complete rotations of the disk. A modern spinning disk system can reach speeds in excess of a thousand frames per second. This is many hundreds of times faster than laser scanning confocal. To compare the two technologies more directly, laser scanning confocal gives the best optical sectioning and resolution, as we don't have the problem of pinhole crosstalk, and we can precisely set the size of our pinholes. With a laser scanning confocal, you can also choose exact emission wavelength range or ranges that you're interested in with multiple photomultiplier tubes and it can also strongly illuminate subregions of the sample for greater detail or for fluorescence recovery after photobleaching experiments. However, spinning disk confocal has far less photobleaching and toxicity. Lower illumination power is needed. You're acquiring, you're acquiring an entire image in parallel, and the sensors that we're able to use in a camera are much, much more efficient than a photomultiplier tube, having a much higher quantum efficiency. Spinning disk confocal is also much, much faster, as we just covered. A spinning disk confocal module is also far cheaper than a laser scanning confocal microscope and can be added to an existing microscope fairly easily. In conclusion, spinning disk confocal microscopy can significantly enhance the contrast and axial resolution of thin samples. This is achieved by blocking the out-of-focus light from other planes other than the one that we're interested in. Imaging can be performed at high speeds with large fields of view, and spinning disk confocal is much kinder to samples than wide field or laser scanning confocal, meaning photo bleaching and phototoxicity are much reduced. There are a few adjustments and alignments that you need to perform to set up a spinning disk microscope in the optimal way, but setup is typically straightforward. So thank you for watching. If you want to learn more about spinning disk microscopy 
or about how to pick a camera for spinning disk microscopy, please follow links on this page for relevant application notes and technical notes, or navigate the Photometrics website to find other technical notes and resources for other applications. Thank you very much.